Let's worship together. Our call to worship. Open wide the doors. Open wide the doors. Open up your hearts. Open up your hearts. Open up your minds. Open up your minds. Open up your voices. Open up your voices. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things and for sins only you know, Forgive us, Lord. Amen. Amen. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us. 
breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our hymn 588, there's a wideness in God's mercy. your books leave them open beside you and if I remember I want you to look back at that hymn after the sermon so just hold your place in that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help 
help save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We won't be talking in detail about the, uh, all of the readings, but as you read, listen to what gives the people in each story meaning in life. The first reading is from 1 Kings. But after a while, the wadi dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a wit widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and for my son, and then we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends, sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she was, she was as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, Neither the, did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Psalm 77, 7 through 20. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love ceased forever? And his promises at an end for all time. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And I say, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water, the skies thundered, your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The second lesson is from Acts. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision 
in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him, and after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice called to him again a second time, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, Suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. Word of God, word of life. Thanks Thanks be be to God. Mark, the second chapter. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around there that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, They removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the mats on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive the sins but God alone? At once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing this question among themselves, and he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sons are forgiven, or to say, Stand up, take up your mat, and walk? But so that you may not may, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Stand up, take your mats, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mats and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Maybe seated. Let's pray together. O Lord God, giver of life, healer, miracle worker, creator of the ends of the earth, of the heavens, of the stars, of the tiny, tiniest creatures, is it true, is it possible that we have the right and privilege to come to you and that you will receive us without delay to hear us, that you are already at work to answer our prayers before we even ask. Who are we, O Lord, that you would receive us in this way? 
this day as we hear and share and contemplate. May we be overcome by your love. May that love change us, claim us, drive out all despair, and send us with joy in a world to spread that love that is more than we can hold or contain to everyone around. May this world that is hurting by violence and hatred and revenge and war, deception, be overcome by your love and your spirit. May the prisons that we find ourselves be broken open. May we be led in freedom to follow your call. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. I think the four scripture readings that we had, the Old Testament, the Psalm, the New Testament, and the Gospel readings, all have a lot, a lot in them about meaning in life. Just the three things that I'll mention is that in the first reading, the woman is an outsider and she's a widow, someone without a defender. Her stigma for the Jews was one who didn't have much worth or much to teach them. The story's about God seeing her. In our second reading, it's about Peter having to come to terms with him seeing a whole class of people as unclean, the Gentiles. And before he was ready to accept Cornelius, who had been crying out and seeking God, he had to have a vision that God does not see people as clean and unclean the way that we do. And in the gospel reading, there is a paralytic, someone whose the prisons he lives in makes it impossible for him to even come to Jesus on his own. And thinking about addictions, the things that make it impossible for even people to find their way to God. In my gatherings with people talking about addictions in the church, the Faith Network, last time I was there, we heard about people who would never enter a church seeking help because the church is associated with a place of condemnation. So think about purpose and meaning, and what is the purpose of the church? There we go. <laughs> to bring people to God, thank you, Lisa. And when we bring people to God, everything changes. Everything changes. I want to tell you three stories, stories about three people with drug dependencies. And I'll tell you that this morning when I was getting ready to come here, my stomach was upheaving. It was retching. And you know what happens sometimes and I'll tell you why. It's because I was going to give a sermon about this. It's because of the content of the sermon. Sometimes when I'm retching like that, Kathy, who has these amazing gifts of healing, will come by me and she'll just put her hand gently on my back and start to rub. My body quiets down and the retching goes away. The first week we talked about the importance of connection and overcoming addictions. What if we don't have someone who is willing to gently massage the pain, the anxiety, the worries? What if instead the voice that we hear from the people of God is one of condemnation? It's your own fault that you have these addictions. So I want to tell you the story about three different people. It's personal, people with drug dependencies. The first one is me. The second one was my mom. The third one was my dad. It hardly gets more personal than that. Telling you stories today that my siblings would be in disagreement over those things being told publicly and recorded and put on YouTube. There are stories that we are not allowed to tell. At one of my congregations who wanted to address the problems of race, and I asked someone, would you be willing to tell your story? And the person said, I could never talk to this congregation about what I've gone through. And I'm so thankful for uh, Antoinette and Sonia's courage to have us um, hear the stories in the Black History Month. But there are many congregations that are not opening, open to hearing those stories, and I thank God for coming to a place where we can talk about hard things 
We have more things to talk about in the future because there's a lot of hard things going on in this world. There's things that we need to talk about that some people in the congregation don't want me to talk about. I'm not going to talk about those things today. <laughs> but to tell you the stories of myself and my mom and my dad makes me wretch before I come to the service. It's hard. And I'm going to tell them in that order, mine and my mom's and my dad's, because that's chronological of the events in life. I grew up as a missionary kid in a community that was, I thought was perfect. I thought our family was a perfect family, and then at my dad's funeral, I said, I found out that wasn't true. It was our neighbors that was a perfect family, and we could never live up to them. It was the Landers, who were perfect in every way, and we were always a few steps behind. And later I found out, like a good friend of mine in Delaware says, we're all a bunch of bozos on the bus. We're together in this. So I grew up in this community where I felt like I was superior because I was a male and because I was white and I was a US citizen. I felt like I was the most powerful person because of those three identities. I felt like when I walked into the store, I should be served first. I'm being honest, as a child. Because that's kind of the twisted message that I got growing up. Then when I went to medical school, I was no longer isolated in this protective bubble that saw the world as the sinful ones are them and were coming to save them as missionaries. All of my classmates were in the same boat as I was. 19 years old, I was working with cadavers. The first day, we didn't, have, we didn't live in a country that had the possibility of giving your body to science. So the first day in the anatomy, the teacher said, most of you are going to fail the year. As soon as you lose 30 points, you fail the year. Anyone who brings in a cadaver gets 10 extra points. So we are all looking at anyone lying by the side of the road and asking, is he breathing? It might be really hard to get your mind around that. But a 19-year-old having to go through very different ideas. I owned a skeleton. And I was looking at this skeleton to learn where all the body parts insert. My strange skeleton, I had one of the most complete ones in my class. I was lucky. But it had two left legs, no right leg. But these skeletons that I'd look at and study thought, I'm holding in my hands someone's loved ones, the remains of someone's loved ones. I was going to medical school. I was learning about life and death and coming to terms with this. And at night, I thought I had every disease I'd studied during the day. It's my first time cooking, and I was sure I was going to die during the night from my own food poisoning. <laughs> Botulism. Scary. And I learned about that. And then we had other things. I was walking through the town, and I got to know at night, because we didn't have phones, I'd walk to the telephone company and call up my parents and cry out for help. Because every day I was struggling with, we're going to fail, we're going to fail, we're going to fail, we're going to fail. Every single day we heard that. There's 80 people who start out in class, 20 of you will pass the year. Maybe, maybe 15 or 20 of my classmates, maybe, graduated. The rest fell by the wayside. And all throughout the year we were watching people crying and find, falling by the wayside. And then there were these things that when I would call, when I go to the telephone company and hopefully get through a, a call to my parents to hear them, to, to be comforted by their voice from my doctor dad to tell me I don't have botulism. I was going to live to see the morning. I even wrote some goodbye letters to my parents. I was that scared of poisoning myself. Um, and my roommate arranged to leave home every third day when it was time for me to cook. But I would walk across the town, and at night I would see where people were putting their babies to sleep, mothers who were homeless, and they had babies, and they were putting themselves to sleep on the sidewalks at 9 o'clock at night. I had a blind beggar that sat beside our house, and he would tell me his stories, and I would sit there and close my eyes, and I would hear the only interaction, the only connection he had with other people was ridicule. He couldn't see anyone to see if they were smiling or not. The only people that ever addressed us, and I was sitting by him, for two years, he would sit outside my front, and lots of times I'd sit and talk to him. People would walk by and say, don't listen to him. He's just trying to get your money. Everything he says is a lie. We were friends, Carlos Eloy Andrade, sitting outside, a beggar 
blind, holding out his hands. And what he was telling me when this person said everything he said is just a lie trying to get money out of you, he was telling me about his favorite memories in life, about the times of life that gave him meaning, about the times when he was able to see his family, and he was just basking in the joy and memory of that, forgetting the problems of that current day. And the lack of connection he had that day is the only people who spoke up were ones to judge him. I would fly home. It cost me like $20 to fly in a 737, an hour home. So once a month, I would fly home for the support of my parents. I'd fly on the 5 o'clock afternoon flight on Sung. And then I would take the 6 a.m. flight Monday morning on Tommy to come back to school. Friday night, 5 a.m., Monday morning, 6 a.m. And I went once a month, one month after I quit medical school. That plane crashed, and there were no survivors. And everyone on it was killed. And they published the pictures in the paper, and there were people that I had been on that plane with over and over and over again. I recognized them, heard them laugh, heard them talk, made way for each other, helped each other with bags. And had a roommate, uh, not a roommate, a classmate. And he um, couldn't buy the ticket. So he was taking a bus to the capital city. And the bus was like a, depending on if there were landslides or not, it was a 12, 15 hour ride. And he came to a point in the bus ride where there was landslide and it blocked the road. And so they had arrived there at night and they waited all night for the caterpillars to come in, all of the uh, heavy equipment to come and open a path so the, drop, and the bus could get through. And after being on the bus all night long, he wanted to get off the bus and stretch his legs. He did, and the woman with him. When they went to get back on, he let the woman go first. He heard a huge noise, and he turned around and ran. The mountainside came down, it took the bus and everyone on it over the side. And he alone escaped. And he came back to school a week later. It took him a week to get back to us, and we thought he was dead. The morning that my classmates were going to call up his parents and tell him that he was in a landslide, he walked in the door, weary, tired, covered, confused. He talked to me about why am I alive and why are they dead. I kept telling my classmates, God is the answer to these questions. These things are confusing. I don't know how to answer them. I loved Ecuador, the beauty of it the gentleness of the people, the richness of the earth. We watched volcanoes erupting out our backyard. The volcano wasn't in our backyard. We could see it from our backyard. We could see a snow-capped volcano about, I don't know, 50 miles away with lava flowing down the side. We saw creatures in the jungles. We saw these things that gave us excitement and meaning. But there was this incredible suffering with the poverty, with the injustice, with the violence. The graffiti on the walls were about the injustice of the church and the power of Padre Cordero, the priest, who was the most powerful person in town. And I got to hear these things in a way that I had not heard them before when I was isolated, growing up in my safe bubble. And so I left there and I went back to a Christian college in Minnesota and I could not wait to be in a community that would embrace me, love me, care for my wounds, and raise me up and help me make sense of things that I couldn't make sense of. And you know what I found when I got to my Christian college that had Bible classes and that had chapel services and that had prayer rooms? Nobody could understand anything I'd gone through and nobody cared. That's what it felt like. My whole meaning system of Ecuador disconnected with the church. And at that time, I went through this depression in which... I was thinking about taking my life. And I thought about that for several days. I couldn't, my sleep was, was disturbed. My appetite, I couldn't eat. I was anxious, couldn't go to class, couldn't focus on these things. I thought, I've been to medical school. I know how to make it succeed. I know where to go where people wouldn't find me. And then it was my birthday. And this was before the days of cell phones. I got several calls in my room. I didn't have a phone, but I got several calls in my dorm room from people, some that I hadn't seen for a couple years, who just called me on that day to, to greet me and say they love me, out of the blue. And I think God arranged for that connection to happen in my disconnection. 
And they had people from my past who called me. They must, I don't know how they got the number. They probably called the, the, the college and said, is there a Daniel Swanson at your school and can you connect me? So I got these phone calls and I got one after another after another completely unexpectedly. And I thought to myself, okay, these people don't know what I'm going through and they called to say they love me. My college doesn't know what Carlos and the other people back in Ecuador are going through. But God knows, and God loves them. And my suicidal thoughts stopped. And I began to have hope because of faith, and that gave me meaning. And my meaning system of faith and the answers started to come together with my experiences on the streets. So we gotta erase the boundaries at that back door. (laughs) and get the gospel not in here and invite people to come to our church, but we have to take the gospel everywhere we go and spread that light. So when I went to seminary, I talked to some pastoral counselor teachers and they told me that it would be good for me to get counseling. And I went to a counselor and she said, it'd be good for you to talk to a psychiatrist because I think that you have depression. So my drug dependency is from this in this little bottle. And as I raise this up to you, you probably say that's legitimate and acceptable because we've come a long way with mental illness. I took this and was able to get over my depression. My symptoms went away, everything was fine. My psychiatrist said, okay, let's discontinue it. One week later, the depression came back. We tried that twice. Everything was stable in life, everything was good. I had motivation, I got up, I could eat, I could sleep. I was excited about life. I'd go off the medication, and within a few days, I was back in this depression. Strange thing is that later, I became a mental health therapist and worked with people every single day, all day long, with depression, with anxiety, with all these different things. And I know about depression, and I know it's an illness, and I know the hopelessness is illness, it's not reality. But if I stop taking this, even though my head knows it, my emotions and my gut and all my body does not know it and I can't talk myself out of the symptoms. The symptoms come. So my psychiatrist said, why don't you just stay on this? So I've been taking this for 30 years, a pill every day. I'm dependent on this to keep me balanced in life. My mother, so do you reject me? Do you accept me? Do you love me? I found as a mental health therapist that there is huge stigma around taking medication. I don't want to be on meds. I won't go off it. My psychiatrist said, this is a sign that either you have chemical dependency in your family, I mean an imbalance, uh, uh, an imbalance that's genetic in your family, or else you have had several serious bouts of depression that were untreated for a number of times. And I think it's because there's depression in my family. We have huge family reunions with you know, over 100 people that come and my brother says we should just have the family reunions at Lake Prozac and everyone go swimming in the lake <laughs> and drink a lot of the lake. We should put it in the baby formulas when we have babies. So my mother, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And at the time, she, so my mother had um, 15 grandkids, there's 15 today, alive grandkids. My mother was diagnosed with cancer in 1999. And the day that she had her surgery, there was protests in Ecuador. My dad had to get a police escort to get to the hospital. My sister saw an ambulance from the hospital. She flagged it down and she was able to get a ride to the hospital there. They did the surgery on, the, on my mom and my cousin came out and saw my sister and said, it's all over. My sister thought that my mom had died in surgery. But she hadn't died in surgery. What, she, what the, the report was is cancer is spread throughout her body. She had ovarian cancer. By the time they found it, it was everywhere. My mother decided she didn't want to go through the treatments. Then she got on the phone and she talked to my daughter and she talked to another grandchild and they were little. They are talking to Grammy, and my mom changed her mind, said, I will take these chemicals, I will take these drugs that are gonna poison my body, that are gonna make me sick, and I'll do that for my grandkids. 
At the time that she was diagnosed with cancer, she had seven grandkids. Eight more were born in the time where she changed her mind to the time that she died. And she got to see all of her grandkids and meet all of her grandkids. But she was dependent on drugs for that to happen. Drugs that were poisoning her, they almost killed her. The third person is my dad. My dad is a missionary doctor, very devout in his piety. We had devotions every day. He prayed before every surgery. He sang through the surgeries. He had a very quieting presence. He was one of the best doctors I've ever met because he was so thorough and he could diagnose things that other people didn't. We did not have out in the jungle advanced diagnostic equipment. My brother's life was saved because out in the middle of the jungle, he diagnosed him with meningitis, spinal meningitis. He had half the oral medications that he needed and he divided them up into every four hours and prayed that God would wake him up and give them to my brother and my brother recovered was able to do the spinal tap and confirm that that's what he had. But instead of dying, there were miracles that happened. And every night I would grow up hearing about miracles at our table that happened that my dad was witness to, of people who shouldn't survive who did. But then my mom died, and my dad remarried, and his second wife died, and they were his social world. He was quiet and not connected with the social world compared to his wife's. And after that die, they died, he went through this deep depression. And the thing about my dad is that he grew up in this stoic Swedish family that never talked about emotions, they didn't recognize emotions. And when I was growing up in our church world, anger was a sin. The Bible says, be angry but do not sin. And what we hear in our community is the only righteous person who has righteous anger is Jesus. The rest of us, whenever we feel anger, it's, it's sin. There's a bunch of other emotions that are sin, too. And so my father could not recognize the emotions in him. What he dealt with all the time was physical pain, and he could diagnose that. And he knew what to do about that. So when my mother and his second wife died, he could not recognize the emotional pain of that. What he could recognize was his body was physically hurting. And so he went to different specialists for different things, and there's a lot of stories I can tell you about how things went wrong. But he became dependent on pain medication. And in his later years, he had pain medications, and he would have these outbreaks, these reactions. It was addictive medication. And he would have these reactions that he would go to the emergency room. And he'd go there on the days that was the absolute worst for my family, on the days where there was the least people around to help him, on the days when we had a lot of other things to do. It was predictable. When he was most isolated is when he had the pain attacks. And he'd end up in the emergency room. And, and this is the part of the three stories that my siblings wouldn't want me to tell you. And I had to fly down to Ecuador because the hospital would not release him until we changed his plan because he'd been going back to the ER on his own and demanding medications. So we brought him to the States and he lived with us for a while and that was really difficult. He was isolated, he was lonely, and Kathy and I would go to work during the day. So then we found him a place in Minnesota, and he, when he got to this home, his siblings, some of them were in this retirement home. All the people from his church were in this retirement home, not all of them, but a lot of them who had retired moved to this home. And there were people that he grew up in Minneapolis and had snowball fights two houses down who moved into this same place. So all of a sudden, he moved into this setting that had this whole social network that he had been separated from for most of his life because that was a sacrifice he made for God. And he came alive, and they were able to get him off the medications and on only what he needed. And I have never seen him so full, socially outgoing, all these different things. He was so excited. He was healthy. He had friends and, and outings that he was going that I'd never seen in life. And then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, they would bring his food to his door, set it down at his door, knock on the door, and they'd leave. And he'd go and pick up his tray, and he'd eat his food. And then he'd put his tray outside, and he'd take it away. The greatest contact he had with other people, the connections, was with you. Do you know my dad? He joined us for Zoom on Sundays. That was his social connection to the larger world. And so people here would greet him by name. 
When COVID came, the pain attacks came back, the emergency visits would come back, the loss of meaning, the loss of connection, and the addictions kicked in. I got to be with him the last 10 days of his life. And you know what? I don't remember him once asking for pain medication because he had a new sense of meaning. He was dying. He's going to see my mom. He's going to see God. He had this whole world coming. And all of a sudden, that request for the pain medication was gone. Three people with dependencies on medications. My mom to extend her life. Mine to live without depression. My dad to fight the demons of emotional pain that he could only recognize as physical. Which one of us is best? How would you rate us? Probably my mom first, because hers was a valiant, glorious story of someone trying to overcome addictions to be with family even when it caused her pain and sickness. Mine next, he's depressed, he's weak, he needs these medications, we've come to grudgingly accept it. My dad's last. You don't need these medications, it's your choice, you're causing problems for your family, you're causing problems for it. He had to leave Ecuador, I got on the plane with him to fly him up here. After he lived in Ecuador 60 years, after he left the place where my mom was buried, after he left his home that he built, after he left his hospital, everything to give his life meaning. He got on the plane, looked out the window, and said, bye-bye, Ecuador. And now he has that meaning all over again. There are things that we can't talk about. I've told you some that my family don't want us to talk about. What would you think of a doctor's visit that says, I need help, but I can't tell you my symptoms? It's private and full of stigma. The church might judge me. Connection, identity, meaning. That's taken a long time. Thank you for hearing the stories about my family. How do we see other people? Can we see past the addictions to the person created in the image of God? Can we welcome them into systems of meaning? And can we take time to find out what are their systems of meaning? Our community of Cumberland right now is in debates over what to do with people under the bridge. You know what I know about them? They're homeless and they're all addicted. And we want them to disappear because they're ruining our economy, they're ruining our appearance. If we could just make them disappear, but they each have lives, they have families, they have stories, and the stigma's getting in the way. The church is a place for healing. Let's worship God. Look at the hymn we saw earlier uh, on your own time. And now we will have the hymn, You Are Mine, (coughs) hymn 581.
Let us stand and join in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through all all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. O Lord our God, we are all like the prodigal son, wondering if there's a place for us in the family of God and in your presence. And you are like the prodigal father When you see us, what you see is not the despised person we think we are, but you see a child of God that you deeply love, that you want to robe and prepare banquets for, that you want to celebrate. Lord, may we see others through your eyes. May we see all as children of God who have dignity. May our hearts break when your children sleep outside. The Supreme Court is faced with the decision whether to criminalize homelessness or not, whether to allow homeless people to be fined and arrested for sleeping in places that other people don't want them to be seen. So in addition to the lack of connection, meaning, stigma that they have, we make them illegal. How has our world gone wrong? Lent is a time for us to hear your word and to turn. May your house become a place that houses your children. May your community that you call be a community that loves everyone that sees the beauty and that helps each of us with the help of the one next to us to rise up again after we fall. Lord, in your mercy. Oh Lord, as we have leaders around the world who have fallen into addictions for power and money and control, they've led to war and violence and greed and hurt. Come break the bonds that hold us prisoner. May your spirit of healing be poured out on this earth, for we need you, and without you, O Lord, this earth cannot survive. Come, Lord Jesus, Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, O Lord, that you never give up on us or your creation, that you change your ways of working to meet our needs. We thank you, O Lord, that even when we want to give up on ourselves, you see the beauty 
And your destiny is our destiny. Your future for us is waiting for us. So in you we rest. May we learn to forgive others as we are forgiven. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, for all those on our prayer lists, those who are grieving lost ones, for Pat's family, for those that we name now silently or loud, they are your children. Claim them as your own. May your healing rain down upon them. May your blessings flow. May you be their glory, the one who lifts their face, their shield about them, their hope. And now to the one who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all we can ask or imagine, to you be the glory. We belong to you. Impossible as that seems. We love you, Lord. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Spread peace.
We pray, Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Indeed, it is right, it's our duty and our joy that we should at all times, in all places, in all circumstances, give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. You welcome all that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels of the church on earth, with the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join there in ending hymn. God, our living water, our merciful guide, together with rivers and seas, with wells and springs, we bless and magnify you. You led your people Israel through the desert. You provided them water from the rock. We praise you for Christ, our rock, our water, who joined us in our desert, pouring out his life for the world. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ broken for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. It's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me, body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Remembering, therefore, his life, death, and resurrection, we await your salvation for all this thirsty world. Pour out your spirit on this holy food, on all the baptized gathered for this feast. Wash away our sin, that we may be revived for our journey by the love of Christ. To him, all glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, both now 
and forever. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come. Amen. Thanks be to God. All are welcome to come and receive. Um, as you come, you can pick up a cup. The ones that have already filled have grape juice. If you bring an empty cup, we'll give you wine up here. And then there is also in the little bowls, there's gluten-free bread for people who need gluten-free. The bread that I will be giving has gluten in it. So if you want gluten-free, bring that up. All are welcome.
now may the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, and renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Sent forth by God's blessings, hymn 547. Peace, share your bread. Thanks be to God.